Good morning. morning. Last weekend, I had the opportunity to uh, attend several sessions led by Stan Knopfsinger, the General Secretary of the Church of the Brethren. Uh, They were at the Mennonite Church USA headquarters on Benham Avenue. Uh, They were similar, but not identical. Ron Nicodemus was there a week ago on Saturday and shared some about that in our sharing time last Sunday. I want to talk to you a little bit about what I heard at those sessions because the numbers and the images from Nigeria are pretty staggering. The country of Nigeria is in West Africa and it has an area comparable to the state of Texas and the state of Oklahoma combined. It has some other things in common with Texas and Oklahoma as well. It's a country that is rich in oil reserves, so it's fairly wealthy in comparison to its neighbors on the continent of Africa. Uh, Nigeria is a member of OPEC. It's a very heavily populated country. About 25% of the population of Africa lives in Nigeria. So one in every four Africans is Nigerian. The Church of the Brethren sent American missionaries to Nigeria in 1923 and they established Hillcrest, a missionary school, started churches and started Culp Bible College which is a school for theological training for Nigerian church leaders. In the 1970s, Ecclesia Yanwa Nigeria, the Church of the Brethren in Nigeria, became independent and self-governed. And since the 1970s, Ecclesia Yanua, Nigeria, has experienced rapid growth. The membership is now larger than its parent church in the United States. Its congregations are concentrated up in the northeast corner of the country, a little bit like the way that the Church of the Brethren in the United States has congregations which are concentrated in Pennsylvania and Maryland and Virginia. It's estimated that until recently, there were 1 to 1.2 million people attending Ecclesia Yanua Nigeria congregations each week. That has now changed. You can see on this inset map that the areas in the dark gold are Church of the Brethren congregations or former congregations and the yellow area is the part of the country that's now under control of the Boko Haram, Muslim extremists. You can see how that area of Boko Haram control corresponds to where the congregations of the Ecclesia in Nigeria are concentrated. And as of this November, more than 350 pastors have been displaced and their churches have been closed or destroyed and 150,000 people or about one quarter of the members of the church have had to flee their homes and their communities. Stan Knopfsinger, who was speaking at the Mennonite Church USA offices in Elkhart, put it like this. Suppose you were at work one day, and you got word that there was a group of heavily armed insurgents, folks with tanks and machine guns in Osceola, and they were advancing toward you, and your office was their target. You have one hour to clear out, and you have to get as far as Toledo, Ohio to be safe. Do you know where your children are, or other family members? You can probably take your laptop from work, but how about all the other files that you have, that you have backed up? Do you know where your state identification is? Your social security cards, passports? Can you freeze your bank account or withdraw all your assets? You have one hour to get out. That is what happened to church leaders in Nigeria. Not just the pastors and local churches, to the church office, the national church headquarters of the Nigerian church. So this is what the road 
out of, not out of that northeast area of Nigeria has looked like for the past couple months. Refugees walking or making their way to safer parts of the country. Many of them are finding housing with other families or other church members in safer areas of the country. They're uh, fleeing the Boko Haram controlled areas and flooding into the cities. Back home, people, family members, church members, Muslim friends and neighbors have been abducted or murdered. Buildings are destroyed. Crops have been rotting in the fields because there's no one to harvest them. And there will be no new crops planted for next year. The Nigerian government has not taken action to defend its citizens from the Boko Haram. The country is majority Muslim, and there's an election coming up in February. When the Boko Haram first attacked this spring, 10,000 Nigerian military troops dropped their weapons and ran. Those were their orders. Until quite recently, the Church of the Brethren was one of only two aid agencies who had responded to the crisis. Now, you might justifiably ask, what does this have to do with Christmas? It's a fair question, especially if Christmas doesn't extend beyond a sweet, quiet little baby in an incredibly sanitary stable under the gaze of adoring parents. And his mom looks amazing for just having given birth in an animal shed, attended by nobody else besides a carpenter, some friendly domestic animals, and a group of really enthusiastic sheep herders. We love to celebrate this Christmas. It's fine to celebrate this Christmas, but Christmas is more than that. The child Jesus and his parents had personal experience as refugees. Just verses after Matthew's account of Jesus' birth in Matthew 2, verse 12, the wise men leave, and an angel appears to Joseph in a dream and warns him that they need to leave and flee to Egypt to escape the wrath of King Herod. They get up and go in the middle of the night. And King Herod takes out his frustration and his anger by killing all of the baby boys in Bethlehem. So that story of weeping for children who have been taken from you by violence, that is part of Jesus' story too. I direct you back to our text, which was the entire 61st chapter of Isaiah. And in my study Bible, this chapter is called The Good News of Deliverance. It's all about bringing good news to the oppressed and binding up the brokenhearted and proclaiming liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. You probably remember that there's good news in the Christmas story, too. An angel appears to those shepherds and says, I bring you tidings of great joy, good news to all people. And then a whole host of angels comes and sings, Glory to God in the highest. Gloria in excelsis Deo. We sang that this morning, too. But the good news of Jesus resonates beyond the Christmas story and the angel's song. Isaiah 61 wasn't just good news back in the day, back in the day of the Babylonian exile or the birth of Jesus. Isaiah 61 is good news right now. And if you don't believe me, listen to Jesus. Some of you will recognize echoes of Isaiah 61 in the New Testament. That's because it's the text that Jesus read at the beginning of his ministry when he spoke in the synagogue in Nazareth. 
You can find this account in Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. Jesus is asked to read in the synagogue, and he's handed the Isaiah scroll, and he looks through it until he finds Isaiah 61, and then he reads directly from it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus goes back and sits in his seat. And when he has everyone's attention, he says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. See, Jesus did not come to earth just to tell us about good news. Jesus is good news. Hopefully, this is good news which we have received and which we can share with other people. The good news of Jesus Christ is release and recovery and healing. But we can also explain it like this. God loved the world so much. Not just me or the people that look like me, but the whole world. God loved the whole world so much that God came to the world in human form to share that love with us. That human form was Jesus Christ, and Jesus was born like any other baby into modest circumstances, born into a world which was sinful and brutal and torn by violence and the misuse of power. Like our world today, Jesus, in Jesus' world, innocent children and families suffered displacement and abduction and death. And like our world, Jesus, was, Jesus' world was a place that desperately needed the good news of healing and release and liberation. Jesus is that good news. That's why Christmas is so important. Jesus is the way that God shared love with the world. And Jesus is the way that we are called to share love with the world, too. I don't know how the situation in Nigeria will be resolved. Nobody does. Stan Nofsinger estimated that it will be at least a 10-year process. For the families of the 270 Chibok girls and the thousands of other Christian and Muslim Nigerians, who's, the families who have had friends and loved ones abducted or murdered, the process of healing and restoration may never be complete in their lifetime. As followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters in name and history, we are called to share love with Ecclesia Yuana on Nigeria in Christ's name. Sharing love isn't the same as sharing money. Ecclesia Yanua on Nigeria has asked for our prayers and spiritual support. We've had the opportunity to do that with district-wide prayer meetings in August. And I trust that there will be more opportunities to come together around that cause. But prayer is something that any of us can do at any time. However you share love this season, whether it's hats and mittens for the kids in Elkhart, prayer for Christians whose churches have been destroyed, prayer for Muslim families who have lost loved ones, prayer for an end to violence in Nigeria or the United States, or monetary donations through our love offering for the people of Nigeria. Be mindful of the ways that you are honoring Jesus Christ. 
Sharing love is a way of remembering that Christmas was and is and always will be a sign of God's love for us. It's a testimony for God's love for the world and a willingness to send his only son to live and die for us. That love is the greatest gift that we can receive and it is the greatest gift that we can share with others. Wherever your Christmas celebrations take you, I pray that it will be somewhere where you will know the love of Emmanuel, God with us. But that love isn't just with us to comfort us. It leads us to walk beside others who may be in need of God's healing and liberation and restoration. May we find ways to share God's love and the incarnate Christ who is good news for all people. Amen.